All right, my friends, and we are live here on the Red Delta Project live feed Q&A and podcast where we take a fundamental approach to fitness to give you more power, control, and freedom over your lifestyle while also greatly simplifying this whole diet and exercise thing. My name is Matt Schiffley of the Red Delta Project. Today's episode is sponsored by the books and resources of the Red Delta Project that are all linked down below in the description, including Duonomic Elvia pull-up handles that fit well in your doorway, NOSC suspension training, and of course, pullupdip.com for all calisthenic equipment needs. And by Spartan Race. Yes, I've teamed up with a special promotion for Spartan Race. We have a new race coming here in Colorado, Colorado Springs, in fact, in uh, early June, so it's only a few weeks away, and I have a special promo code to get you 100% free entry for the first 50 participants. All you got to do to be eligible for this code is film yourself or take pictures of yourself, post it on Instagram with the hashtag RDP race. And I will go and search for those sorts of things. You can also let me know an email if you so choose, you want to make sure I see it. And I will send you that promo code for the free race entry. So if you've ever wanted to do a free Spartan race here in the Colorado Springs area, now is your chance. Once again, promo code RDP race as a hashtag in social media, particularly Instagram, and I will send you that code. So today's episode is kind of inspired by a question that I got this past week where someone was asking me, Matt, if you had to lose weight, a good amount of weight, how would you go about it? And I love these kinds of questions because whenever I get them initially, I'm like, oh, it's just X, Y, and I do this, and it's like no big deal. But the question kind of gets stuck in the back of my head and over several days, I think about it, I'm like, actually, I would do things very different from what other people would do. In fact, I would do a lot of things very different and realize, okay, I really need to cover this topic more in depth than simple email or YouTube video. And that's what I reserve some of these podcasts for is the best content that I can possibly deliver to you. And also uh, the simple fact of, I need to get this out of the way, of course, because I know I'm going to get called out on it, is the fact of, yeah, I know, I'm lean. I've never had to lose weight a day in my life. I'm lean now. I've always been lean. And people may call that out and be like, why should we take any sort of weight loss advice from you? You've never had to lose weight, which is 100% fair and completely true. Because if I always said, you know, any sort of ex uh, opinion that's not based on experience is just a guess. So when it comes to struggling with weight loss, believe me, there's a lot I'm guessing with because I've never had to experience that. However, with that said, I have spent a great deal of my youth and my fitness career struggling with my weight. Uh, that might seem a little crazy. People are like, but if you're lean, how could you struggle with your weight? But the fact is you can struggle with your weight no matter what weight you are. If you're struggling with diet, compulsive exercise disorders, eating disordered habits, body dysmorphia, uh, emotional eating, all these sorts of things, those depend absolutely not one iota on your actual weight or body fat levels. If you have them when you're overweight, you will still have them when you're lean. In fact, a lot of the people I know who struggle with weight management do so even though their friends and family would tell them a million times a day, you've got the perfect body, you're totally lean, you've got shredded abs, what are you worried about? And that's kind of the first lesson here is that being lean doesn't remove any of these problems and struggles. So a lot of this advice is kind of coming more from my experience of those struggles with those issues, obsessive compulsive eating disorders, compulsive exercise disorders, body dysmorphia, emotional uh, residual effects with eating, uh, anxiety around food, like all these things that commonly plague seemingly people who are struggling to lose weight, I've had to deal with those in spades as well. And it didn't really matter if I needed to lose weight or not. And that's what this is largely based off of. So when it comes down to what would I do? Well, let's start off with the things that I wouldn't do. And the first thing is I wouldn't really put any sort of weight or you know proverbial weight or dependency on any sort of diet or exercise program. Not a single one, which I know kind of goes a little bit against what you'd hear. Like, oh, if you want to lose weight, you should do this kind of diet. And if you want to lose weight, you should do this kind of exercise and this kind of stuff. I wouldn't bother with any of that at all. 
And I wish I never bothered with any of it for uh, various reasons. The biggest one is there's no such thing as a direct stimulus for weight loss from any form of diet or exercise. There's no such thing as weight loss exercise. There's no such thing as a weight loss diet. And I know that's like what you hear that all the time. That's everywhere. How can you say that doesn't exist? It exists in our imagination. Because when you really get down to the fundamental laws and principles of mother nature and what's really governing fitness and weight management and stuff like that, we have to come to the honest terms with the fact that when we exercise and when we diet, we are never telling the body to be leaner. That instruction impetus simply does not exist. So by trying to find that stimulus, and this is why no one can do it, is because they're like, what kind of exercise program is best for weight loss? And everybody's got debates on, you know, cardio or weightlifting or hit versus slow and stuff. The reason why nobody agrees is because it doesn't exist. We all perceive it in our own world, but there's no clear uh, stimulus. Same thing with diet. It's a little bit more connected to diet. And, you know, a lot of people like, can't out train a bad diet, but this is the type of diet you should be doing and stuff. But even there, it does not exist. And the reason is simple. When we are training of any kind from powerlifting to ping pong, what we're doing is we are creating a functional demand. We're basically telling the body, hey, body, I need you to be able to do this thing that I'm asking you to do. And the body then goes through an adaptive process to accommodate the, the functional demand of that activity. You need to run faster. You need to jump higher. You need to be stronger. You need to have endurance. You need to have coordination. All these things are functional demands. And your body will accommodate those 100% of the time, every single time. I don't care what you do. You take on any new physical demand, your body will accommodate to further uh, abil the ability to do that demand 100% of the time. That's why I always say there's no such thing as an ineffective workout or set or rep. Exercise is 100% effective every single time for every single person when it comes to satisfying the functional demand. Because you take on a, a new demand of any kind, you will always get better at doing it because that's what it's really there for. The desire to lose weight and stuff, that's a lot more murky. That's a lot more nuanced and stuff. And there's no guarantee it's ever going to work to any degree. Same thing with diet. Right? You should be like, but I'm eating this way. I'm not eating carbs. I'm not eating sugar. I'm doing fasting and all. Yeah, exactly. But again, your body does not hear that you need to lose weight stimulus. Instead, it's saying you just change your environmental stimuli or environmental nutritional uh, environment, I guess. I'm mixing up my words here. Basically, all your body knows is, okay, we used to have a lot of this type of food in our environment. Now we need to somehow survive and be as healthy as possible with this other kind of food. That's all it knows. So yes, there's adaptation there too. Diet conditions your body just as much as exercise. But the whole point of physiological adaptation to both diet and exercise is to get you back into a homeostatic state. So with Exercise, that means being able to functionally do whatever you're telling your body it needs to do. And when it comes to diet, being able to regain your physiological equilibrium in order to, you know, not do things like die. So that means getting back to a car to a caloric balance, back to an energy balance, back to a nutrient balance, back to an ability to regulate and balance itself out. Because if you don't, sooner or later, you die. It's not a very, it doesn't end well, right? So all of that adaptation, and there's a lot of adaptation to diet, the gut bacteria, your digestive process, even the very taste buds on your tongue, everything changes. And the whole point of that adaptation is get back to homeostasis so you don't die or at least suffer severe health consequences. But what that means is getting back to the caloric balance means stopping weight loss. That's why my little inside joke when people are like, I was doing this workout program, I was doing this diet, and I was losing weight, and things were great, and now I'm not losing weight, I always kind of like, great, it worked. And they're like, no, it didn't work. Like, that's not what I wanted to happen. Well, tough cookies, sunshine. That's what's supposed to happen every single time. No matter what diet and workout program you're on, it's training you to not lose weight. It's training you to stop losing weight. And the more you do that, 
the faster it happens. This happens all the time in bodybuilding and figure competitions where someone will go on a rigorous diet and exercise program and they'll lose weight for like several months and they'll get down to their stage weight. And then after the competition, they put the weight back on and stuff. And then after a bit, they get the competition bug again. And they're like, okay, I'm going to do exactly what I did before to lose the weight. And instead of losing weight for, you know, five months, they lose weight for two months because their body's like, oh, this again, great. We know what this is. Bang, let's readapt faster. So that way you don't do as much of the weight loss thing. Cause that gives us a better chance of, you know, surviving and stuff. Your body doesn't know it's trying to step on stage. It just knows I'm trying not to die here. So that's why, again, we think in our brain, it's not working. No, exactly. That's how it works. We don't get to perceive the purpose behind these things in a different way, just because we want them to have a different end. Instead, we have to align our expectations with what mother nature is really actually doing. So that's the first reason. I wouldn't bother with any particular diet and exercise program at all. You know, carbs versus keto versus paleo versus fasting. I wouldn't bother with any of that stuff unless you just want to do it for the sake of doing it. You know, some people, they're just like, I just feel good when I do intermittent fasting. Great. Go for it. Wonderful. But I don't, I wouldn't use any of that as a viable weight loss strategy, solely that. You know, and the second reason why I wouldn't do any of that is, yes, you certainly can uh, create a calorie imbalance by becoming more active with exercise and by cutting back on caloric intake and junk food and stuff with diet, you certainly can move the needle. I'm not saying it won't happen. I'm saying it's not reliable. And you certainly can have that happen. But the biggest, another big reason why I would never rely on this type of exercise or that type of diet is that no matter what you choose, it's going to be a very limited stimulus. It's gonna be very limiting in your ability to lose weight. I don't care how great it is. I don't care what the science is behind it. No matter what you do, you're limiting yourself significantly. And that's because, again, on a fundamental level, your weight and body fat regulation depends on the process that's always ongoing of caloric balance. You know, you're constantly consuming energy and expending it. And it's the balance between those things. Now, e exercise, and diet are certainly big influences to that. So you certainly can move the needle, but no matter what you do, it's going to have some influence on that process. You cannot control the process outright. If you could, that means you can control mother nature. You can control the universe. You are God, right? In that, which case you probably wouldn't be worrying about trying to lose any sort of belly fat. But that's the thing is no matter what you're doing, it's a limited influence. It can be a relatively big influence. If you came to me and you're like, I'm not going to eat any carbs or any sugar, and I'm going to fast three days a week, and I'm going to run marathons every week and all this stuff. I'm like, great, that's going to be a huge influence, but it's still an influence. You cannot have full control over that. So that's why, again, I wouldn't get stuck with like, I'm going to do intermittent fasting and an hour of cardio a day. Okay, great. But both of those will only take you so far. They're only going to have so much influence. They're only going to do so much, and it's probably not going to be enough in the long run. It might feel like enough initially. You're like, I'm down 10 pounds this week. Great. It's always exciting at first, but we got to think long term here as well. Think 5, 10, 15 years in the future. And short term success is relatively easy. Long term success is the hard part. So that's the other reason why I wouldn't bother with any particular diet or exercise program is my hopes and dreams of losing weight. And then the last one is simply that it just gets you stuck following a particular method that can prevent you from being flexible. Because when it comes to managing one's weight, our approach needs to be flexible because you're going to change, your environment's going to change, your circumstances are going to change. No matter what method you use, it's only going to work for so long, and then it's just not going to be applicable to your circumstances. So we want freedom and flexibility to change how you're being active, to change how you're feeding yourself, to change things on the diet and exercise standpoint in order to keep the ball moving forward. And that's why, again, I would never just say, I'm going to do this kind of diet or that kind of exercise, because I wouldn't put my hopes and dreams on any sort of particular method. And instead, keep my focus on influencing that process however the hell I want to do it. 
You know, I would just do whatever kind of physical activity I want to do and whatever kind of dietary approaches and stuff just fit me best for the circumstances I'm in. And I wouldn't worry about carbs versus fat or low carb, low fat, keto or paleo or any of that sort of thing. I would just be like, if I don't honestly have an intrinsic value to it, like being vegan for the sake of, you know, environmental issues, animal rights and stuff, you don't want to eat the cute cows in the field. That's fine. Great. Go for it. Religious reasons. Awesome. Plenty of good reason to follow the dietary preferences for those. Awesome. But if you don't have those, there's literally zero good reason to follow any particular diet. Zero. And some people are like, well, food allergies. Well, yeah, but I'm assuming you know if you have a peanut allergy or something, don't eat peanuts. I shouldn't really have to mention that here. But anyway, that's the first tip uh, perspective here, kind of laying the groundwork here. Let's get to some of these questions people writing in fast and furious, outstanding. Again, if you put a hey mat in the comments section, and you, I know that's something directed at me. Target Destroyer X. I love that. <laughs> that avatar is sweet, man. Uh, Matt, hope you're well, sir. My main problem is I'm trying to get more sleep because I feel the most important thing to do for my body. You're absolutely right. Yes. In fact, there have been many times when I've told people who are struggling with any aspect of their health and fitness, particularly with weight loss, I'm like, okay, diet, exercise stuff, whatever. I don't care. But right now your sleep sucks. You've got to get that nailed down because if you're getting good sleep and good rest, everything becomes so much easier a million times easier. And if you don't, everything becomes so much more of an uphill battle. So sleep, I mean, obviously it ranges. You know, some people, they're just not getting good sleep because, you know, they're up late at night on social media or they're getting caught up on uh, Netflix or video games or something. And it's like, no, I just need a little bit more of a bedtime routine and be a little more disciplined about getting to bed earlier. But other times it can be a real serious disorder. I have a very good friend of mine who was a, an absolute badass. He was a guard at a correctional facility and like an MMA fighter and stuff. I mean, the kind of guy you would never want to cross in a street. I'm glad he was my friend because I certainly wouldn't want him as an adversary. And he had very extreme training regimens back in the day to the point where he really kind of messed up his endocrine system and stuff. And sleep was always hard to do. It's like, in that case, see a professional. So where are you on the spectrum? You know, is it just simply a matter of habits and just needing to get to bed at a regular time and have like a cool down period? Are you drinking too much and you have to keep getting up in the night to go to bed to uh, take a, a pet piss or something and that keeps waking you up? Or do you maybe have some serious like chronic sleep disorders and need to get that taken care of? But yeah, don't don't be one of these people. I could get by on four hours of sleep. I don't want to get by. God, no, I want to thrive. I want to do as well as possible. And that's certainly a lesson that I've been getting uh, the past several months because I've recently no longer been working at a job that requires me to get up at 4 a.m. And boy, oh boy, has that made a big difference in my health, my performance, my quality of life and everything else. Finesse, fitness, excuse me, uh, asking, hey, Matt, how do I structure a calisthenics program uh, with Greek god proportions in mind? Well, Personally, for me, I prefer the Asian gods. Like, I, I like to look like Buddha instead. But, you know, to each their own. Uh, like old school bodybuilders. So a large portion of this, and this certainly should be addressed, of course, when it comes to weight loss too, is a lot of our ability to, to develop the aesthetic qualities of the body and how we look very much comes down to luck and genetics. I know, we don't want to hear that. We just don't want... Because all the messages that we hear in our fitness culture, which is 90% just marketing, trying to sell us stuff, is that we can mold and shape and control how our body looks through diet and exercise. And not that you can't, you certainly do influence that, but you can't control it. And this is one of the things with, with uh, weight loss as well. I fully recognize that my lean physique is mostly a product of my genetics. Mostly genetics. Now, if you asked me 20 years ago, I'd be like, I have such a good diet. I'm so disciplined about my workouts and stuff. And that's not to say that stuff didn't matter. Genetics does not discredit work. But, you know, now that I understand things more on a fundamental level of how fitness really works, I do have to come clean and be like, yeah, I got lucky in the genetic lottery. That's why I have abs, even though I eat junk food every day. And I have the body that I have, even though I seemingly do very little for it. That doesn't mean the exercise isn't important, it is, but it's not like I've done something special for it. I got lucky. 
So let's return to your question though. You're not asking about any of this stuff. You're asking about structure. So you can structure it however the hell you want. I honestly don't think it matters very much provided that you have whatever tempo and speed and uh, frequency you can best make progress with. So when it comes to workout structure, most of what makes a workout structure work is, can you stick to it? Does it work in your schedule? Does it include exercises that you can proficiently do? So I could say, okay, do you know all these push-ups, and you're like, but I I don't I can't do push-ups. I got a bad shoulder or whatever. Okay, out with the push-ups. Most of what makes diet and exercise work is based largely on just personal preference and proficiency. What can you do, and what do you like doing? That's ninety percent of what's going to work for you. The second thing is make sure you're sticking to the basics. You know, pull-ups push-ups, dips, basically compound movements. Compound movements, push, pull, and squat. The three movement chains that I talk about in, in uh, grind style calisthenics, most of that, quote, Greek god physique is probably going to be built with pushing, pulling, and squatting movements. So prioritize those. You're not going to get the body of a Greek god if you just do a ton of ab work. Uh, you want to have the basic push, pull, squat. Now let's talk a little bit more about the, the science around proportions, okay? Because we can influence that a little bit. Number one is focus on back and biceps. So pulling is your thing. Shoulders as well, because we want to get wider, a little bit more top heavy. And a lot of that's going to come from your shoulders. So back, getting a little bit of that V-cut. And again, the V-cut depends almost entirely on genetics because some people, their lats, if you look at them, they get a nice V. Other people, it's just straight down blocky style. That's what I got. You know, I got a blocky torso. I'm always going to have a blocky torso. There's nothing I can do about that because that's just where my muscles connect. If I get bigger and jacked, it's just going to be a bigger block. <laughs> if I get small and lean, it's going to be a smaller block, but it's always going to be a block, so to speak. So uh, be mindful of trying to uh, develop shape versus size. You can only get size when it comes to your, your physique. You can't develop shape but you can develop the shape roughly of a physique by building up the topper, the upper part of the, the body versus the midsection. So uh, the push-ups, uh, handstand stuff works very well. Make sure you prioritize those and also uh, make sure you're getting your legs pretty good as well. And those are the two or three things that are probably going to do the best. And again, prior, uh, structure it however you want uh, throughout the week, whatever is best for you and uh, have a feeling like, you're going to um, just stick to it and make good progress. One more before we get back on topic, Ravi, it's hard to watch YouTube videos on fitness, and not end up feeling like I need to bulk and cut. I have to remind myself that I only really need to care about strength and health. Yeah, and don't feel like it's complete nonsense. Like I certainly know a lot of people where they'll be like, you know, I just can't seem to move the needle in the gym and stuff. It's like, great, eat more. You know, I, I'm not a bulk and cut guy. I don't recommend it. I'm not, I've talked at length about the myth of the calorie surplus and stuff. You eat more, you build muscle. That's not a calorie surplus. That's eating more of what you can use. But I'm not at all against experimenting with eating more or eating less to m potentially move the needle. Because sometimes, yeah, you're better off eating more. So give it a shot. You know, and most of the time it's just, increase portion sizes or decrease portion sizes of what you have and see if that uh, matters to a degree because a lot of your ability to influence that caloric uh, process boils largely down to just portion control you know it's like okay should i eat the strawberries or are blueberries okay it's like no you're way splitting hairs you're putting way too much time and energy towards things that honestly aren't going to really influence that process very much think portion control you know if you're like i just can't seem to make much happen change your portions and that may, you know, bulking and cutting and so forth. That's like, no, it's just eating more or eating less. All right. So when we're talking about that process, that's all I would care my, take care of is my caloric energy. I've constantly got ca calories in, calories out. Oh, one more thing I wouldn't bother with. Any sort of methods that are based around the idea of burning fat or storing fat. Two terms that seem threatening or hopeful, but ultimately are meaningless. You know, people will say all the time, oh, if you eat that, you're going to store fat. Or if you do that, you're going to store fat. I don't care. doesn't matter to me. 
or this exercise burns fat, or this type of diet trains you to burn fat. Again, I don't care. That's a complete waste of time as far as I'm concerned. Why? Because you don't need to do anything for that to happen. Your body is always burning fat, and it's always storing fat. Yeah, okay, we could make the argument you eat this, your body is shifting insulin levels and stuff, you're not burning fat, you're storing fat. Yeah, okay, I don't care. If it happens over the course of an hour, it's going to stop happening after an hour, and then I'm going to switch over. It's not something I'm going to base my hopes and dreams on. I don't care if I'm burning, and I don't care if I'm storing. They're largely wild goose chases because in the end, it still boils down to in versus out. And no matter how you eat and no matter how you exercise, you're always going to have both. You cannot stop or prevent or start and continue either of them. So it's two more things I just not care about, not worried about. I would not waste my time with it. So when it comes down to that process, I would look towards the habits that are going to make it the easiest to have by far the biggest impact on that. And again, like I said, I would not rely on any particular diet and exercise habits, uh, diet and exercise method rather, because it's going to be so much smaller. It's going to be so much more limiting than what I'm about to tell you, which can have much more of a collective influence. And it's going to be a hell of a lot easier to follow because always remember, Success always follows the path of least resistance. So we have to carve that path towards what we want, which is potentially influencing how much is going out versus going in. Anzi Wan asking, Hey Matt, I need some of your point of view with my level of strength. I am able to do a good amount of reps on some pull-ups with good quality, but I, but I do muscle up, I get stuck. Any tips on this? So how high is your pull-up going? That's the, the one thing that I would really concern myself with. How high is that going? Uh, if there's anything that can get you, because it's always the bar. You know, one of the reasons I'm not a big fan of muscle ups is because it's basically two exercises that are easily doable and accessible to a lot of people, but it's the transition that gets you. So the muscle up is all about working a transition. I'm like, I don't care about the transition. I go and do pull ups and then I go and do dips. Like the bulk of your ability to build muscle and strength depends on dips and pull-ups in, in that regard. So just do dips and pull-ups. I don't care about the transition. It doesn't really have a whole lot of influence on creating a stimulus to get build muscle and strength. It's kind of more of a skill thing. But I know a lot of people like that. So uh, it's certainly worth doing if you like it. But I don't do muscle-ups just because I couldn't possibly care less. But if you are looking to do that transition, what you want to do is work on pull-ups and get as high as you can. So don't be satisfied with getting your chin over the bar. Uh, you may have seen a little tangent here. Uh, there's a social media post of the guy who can do 100 pull-ups going around. And he's literally like, he's moving his arms like this. And he's basically just lifting his chin up over the bar like that. Don't be that guy. <laughs> get your chest to the bar. And what that's going to require is more of a depressed scapula and retracted scapula at the top. And that's what you need, because a lot of times when people try to do muscle ups, their shoulder blades are elevated and protracted. And it, yeah, you're gonna get stuck because you're basically just only going so high, you can only bring your hands so far. But when you're back and down, now you can kind of get yourself over the bar. Same thing with your straight bar dips. Get down as low as you can on that bar and then you know maybe come underneath it or come back up so you're basically what you're doing is you're taking that window of the transition that's uh difficult and inaccessible and making it smaller over time your pull-ups are getting higher your dips are getting lower so if you have a big window of transition between the two moves it's literally like trying to get a big bridge against two chasms or two edges of a chasm it's a huge distance and it's really hard to clear but if you can get it to be smaller and smaller and smaller, then it's a lot easier. So that's what I would uh, go after right there. So when it comes to influencing that balance, let's turn to both things. Okay, We want to attack this thing from both sides. It's a team effort, in other words. Trying to rely on one thing or one influence, that's like a, a sports coach saying this one player on the team there are hopes and dreams for a championship. All you guys, don't worry about it. Just sit on the bench. Now you don't really matter very much. Yeah, you just go out on the field and just do whatever. I don't care you know, kind of thing. It's like, uh, that's one guy in a team. Of course, championships are team effort. 
it's team, even is seemingly solo pursuits like in tennis and stuff. They've got a team of people behind them who have gotten them to the level they're at. They have coaches and they have uh, people who improve their performance. Every professional athlete is one of a team. So we want this to be a team effort. And the more influences you can bring in, the more of a collective influence you're going to have on that caloric energy balance. Plus, it's a hell of a lot easier to maintain. Plus, you gain that flexibility. Plus, it's a heck of a lot more fun, too, rather than putting your eggs in one basket. So let's talk about uh, diet first just because it's one of those things uh, that people struggle with. And that's the other thing, as I said, uh, you know, success always follows the path of least resistance. If we're struggling, we need to make it easier. So these will make it a lot easier. Number one, my three P strategy that I always talk about in my books and my eBooks and everything, any, any sort of products that I've created, uh, it's gonna come up sooner or later. And the reason for that is because that three P strategy will pretty much take care of diet to a large degree. And if you're not familiar with it, the basic is every single time you're sitting down to a meal, you mind your three Ps. Number one is protein. Make sure you have a good protein source. Number two is plant. Make sure you have some sort of a plant-based source just for the sake of nutrient profile and such. And number three is portion, the portion of everything. Uh, so you're not eating too much. Or like I said earlier, portion control. Sometimes it needs to be more. Sometimes it's less. But also the portion of everything in there. Right. If you sit down and you're like, okay, plants, um, sprig of parsley, <laughs> protein, uh, some Parmesan cheese grated. And what's the rest of it? Just nothing but a massive bowl of pasta and olive oil. Okay. Yeah. Technically, you've got plants and protein in there, but do you really have good portions of it? You, it's obvious. But if you look at it and you're like, okay, protein, I got a really good protein source and I got a side salad that's plant and stuff. And I got a little side of fries and, or pasta or something. Okay, now we're talking sort of thing. So that three P strategy will basically form the foundation for everything I would do for a diet. Just that, just that, that I would, good diet's taken care of. I don't need to worry about anything else. And then it's just about tweaking the system a little bit, tweaking portion sizes, tweaking uh, the amount that I'm eating throughout the day and stuff. That's all I would focus on is just that. That would be my foundation right there. More questions here. Tim Mayer, hey Matt, thoughts on training hard, but not intense, e.g. weighted dips, no fatigue. Well, you're gonna have some fatigue, of course, uh, but I know what you mean. Uh, making the best, most of the easiest exercise push-ups, uh, but intense. So intensity, I think a lot of times people get a little confused on what intensity means. Like if you're doing you know, weighted dips, and you're like, I got 50 of them, but I stopped beforehand. That's more intense than if you did a thousand push-ups to failure. Because intensity is in the exercise science standpoint, the amount of work your muscle is doing per unit of time, how much tension there is, AKA strength, right? If you jog for a marathon and you just drive yourself into the ground over four hours and you're stumbling across the finish line and you're all dehydrated and you're just exhausted and you just collapse. That's not intensity. That's not intense. That's a lot of endurance. Sure. And it's intense. Like, dude, that was so intense, bro. Yeah. That kind of intense, but not actually physical muscle intensity. Intensity is like sprint your mother living hell off going up a hill. Like a bear is chasing after you. And you get to the top and your heart is in your throat and your muscles are just turned to lead and stuff. That's intensity. So we, I always try to get clear on that's what I always talk about with intensity. Doing push-ups to the point where your arms are going to fall off, that's not intensity. Unless you're doing it with a lot of tension, a lot of tension. And so whenever it comes down to programming workouts, you just got to prioritize one or the other. What are you after? Do you want endurance? Do you want intensity and how much strength is in the muscle? Or are you kind of going after both and just work capacity of the muscle? And those are basically the three goals when it comes to your working the muscle. Endurance, uh, stamina, intensity, or work capacity, like just pushing it as hard as you can. All three are, quote, intense, but technically only the strength one is really intense. The other two are just different levels of intensity. So do you want stamina, intensity, or work capacity? and base your programming off of which one of those do you want to grow?
because they're all great. They're all fine. It's just don't go after one when what you really want is the other sort of thing. It's a sad thing when people get what I call goal hijacking, where people will say, oh, you should train this way. And it's actually the opposite of what they actually want. If you want to build a lot of strength, for the love of God, don't do, you know, marathon like training work. <laughs> you know, you want to emphasize strength. Always remember the simplest principle in exercise science, the said principle, which basically what boils down to is you gain that which you challenge. Remember, because exercise is only about functional demand. What do you want your body to do? And then challenge your ability to do that. <laughs> That's basically the most simple way to boil down exercise science to get what you want out of it. Okay, so when it comes to the diet side, we got the three Ps. Uh, the easiest way to cut back, though, if you're like, okay, but I just need to cut back on uh, calories, what do you recommend? Well, there's two things that I would recommend. The first one is, depending on your circumstances, and this is why there's no such thing as blanket rules in fitness, but go after liquid calories first. Because by far, generally, it's the easiest form of calories to really block out. Like you can easily consume thousands of calories a day in liquid form. But if you sat down to that much cal that many calories, even in the form of junk food, you'd be like, dude, that's, that's a lot of food. That's, you feel like you eat a lot. But you know, you go to Starbucks and you get your Mapo, Frappo, Laco, Chino with extra caramel and whipped cream and stuff like that. It's like, dude, that's like five pieces of cake, <laughs> calorie and sugar wise. I was with a friend one time and she had one of those things and it was a big venti kind of thing. And I was eating an ice cream sandwich and I was like, hang on. And I'm like looking up because she's getting me, giving me crap for the ice cream. You're like, you're a trainer. You're eating that ice cream. Yada, yada. And I looked up, you know, just the general nutrition information, which isn't always the most reliable, but it gets us in the ballpark. I'm like, your Starbucks there is the equivalent of five of these. Like I'm eating one. I'm eating sugar wise, calorie wise, fat wise and everything a fifth of what you've got there. And I'm like, how many of those do you drink in a week? She's like, more like how many in a day? And I'm like, oh, dear Lord, you know, that's just the thing. So I would, if possible, if you can do it, because it all boils down to what are you willing to do? You know, can you get rid of pretty much any caloric source in liquid form? So of course, that's your main culprits, you know, sodas, juices, frappo mappo laco chino, sugar bomb thingies. But it can also be applied for smoothies, you know, protein shakes, stuff like that. It's not going to have a much lower calorie or sugar content just because you call it a protein shake or it comes from a healthy smoothie bar kind of thing. I worked at a gym with a smoothie bar and man, we had smoothies that had over 1500 calories and more sugar in them than, like I said, like several candy bars. I'm like, but it's got protein in it. That doesn't disqualify it kind of thing. So if possible, eat your calories, don't drink them because you can get them out of your diet and it doesn't really do a whole lot to affect your hunger and satiety cues. And you're theoretically removing hundreds, maybe even thousands of calories without having to change what you eat at all. So that's the first place that I would go is what are you drinking? Get the calorie free stuff, straight coffee, tea, water, seltzer water, diet sodas, if that's your thing, right? I'm not saying you'll lose weight if you drink diet sodas, but if you're going from regular Coke to diet Coke, that can really put a big caloric dent in your caloric consumption to a significant degree. All right. Yeah. So when it comes to the other side of things, though, it's like, yeah, but what about food? Well, refer to my free ebook over on reddeltaproject.com called calorie hacking. Calorie hacking is exactly what it sounds like. Because remember, I said earlier, the whole point of any dietary intervention is ultimately to prevent you from losing weight. Now, you can start losing weight during the adaptation period, because anytime you change anything about your diet, you're sending a signal to your body that oh, our apple cart's kind of upset a little bit. We're a little off kilter. So we got to write ourselves back up and that can take time. And while that's happening, you may be losing fat, you may be losing weight and your diet is quote working, but that's supposed to be a temporary process. It may be temporary for several weeks, hell, even several months, but it's supposed to be temporary because eventually your body gets back to a homeostatic balance, which is really what it's trying to do. So in light of that, 
it kind of sounds a little defeating. Like no matter what I do, I'm going to get back to that. Yes, you will. And the big mistake a lot of people make is they get super restrictive in their diet and what they're eating and how much they're eating and stuff. They will get back to a caloric balance. And then you're kind of screwed because you have literally taught your body don't lose any more weight on a very restrictive diet. And then you've not only stopped losing weight, but you've made it so much easier to regain it. Because if you basically trained your body to regain a homeostatic caloric balance, eating nothing but organic kale chips and 1200 calories a day, it's gonna take nothing to go into a real calorie surplus where you're getting more body fat again. It's so much easier when you're more restrictive like that. You've basically kind of painted yourself into the proverbial corner. So that's why I use uh, calorie hacking is get your diet stable first, you know, plant protein portions, good. Satisfy your hunger and stuff so you don't have any cravings and things. Get that level. Uh, cut back on liquid calories as much as you can. And then after you've done all that, you've got that taken care of, then we can calorie hack. And calorie hacking is basically like micro dieting. I included it in my book, Micro Workouts, because it's like micro dieting. Basically what you're doing is you are removing a large portion of calories out of your diet for a finite period of time, a day or two, maybe a week. And you can do that a million different ways. Some people do it with intermittent fasting, great. Some people do it literally saying, I'm gonna eat half of whatever I eat normally. You know, I usually have a foot long sandwich for lunch. Good, six inch, <laughs> right? I usually have a five of, you know, donuts for breakfast. Good, two donuts, whatever. It just has to be a lot less than what you're used to. And that way you're literally just hacking out a lot of calories. And then at the end of that period, then you're like, okay, I kind of come back to normal mainstream diet, whatever I have, maybe a little bit less as you're losing weight, you're gonna have to eat a little bit less, but it puts you more in control. And it kind of prevents you from getting painted in that proverbial corner because you're not training your body over time how to maintain homeostatic calorie balance with as restrictive a diet as possible. And then anything you do coloring outside the lines is setting you up for quickly weight uh, gain. All right, more questions here before we get into the exercise portion. Ray Allinger, hey Matt, this is exactly where I am. I uh, evacuated from Ukraine. Wow, and all routines went out the window. Holy smokes, my friend. Good, uh, good on you that you got out of that situation. But uh, my, uh, I was going to say condolences, but I don't know if you've known anybody who's perished in that. But uh, holy smokes, um, yeah, I know it's like <laughs> that's a good gut check whenever i run into things like that uh, joe desena of uh, spartan race i attended a workshop uh, hosted by zach evanish one time and joe was one of the main speakers and he's like what are we complaining about seriously like we've got food we've got housing we've got clean water i've got you know fun toys i can work out with you know you you run into people who literally had to flee their country under a war threat and it's like, what am I complaining about, right? <laughs> exactly. So uh, very good perspective for you. So in light of this, my friend, you're like routines right out the window. Let's talk about the exercise portion. So we've got the three Ps, minimizing liquid calories and calorie hacking for the dietary standpoint. Great. So that's a good way to influence our caloric intake. But what about expenditure? What about caloric expenditure? Here we go. Now, here's the great thing. When I say there's no such thing as weight loss exercise, people kind of get a little frumpy and they're like, oh man, so there's nothing I can do to tell my body to be leaner? Well, here's the good news. There's no such thing as weight loss exercise because everything is weight loss exercise. A calorie burned is a calorie burned regardless of why it's being burned. And furthermore, like I said earlier, like I don't care if I'm burning fat. I don't care if I'm storing fat. I don't care. Just burn something. People are like, you're burning fat or you're burning sugar and stuff. I don't care. Burn something. It really doesn't matter. In fact, Marty Gallagher's book, uh, Strong Medicine, a big part of that book is literally about if you want to lose fat, burn sugar. Burn sugar. A large portion of that book is all about managing sugar levels. And they're like, burn sugar, burn sugar. That's one of the best ways to burn fat is burn sugar. I'll go more into that in detail in future episodes and stuff. But that's one of the reasons why I kind of laugh when people are like, you've got to become, you know, shift your metabolism over to becoming fat dependent and all that. It's like, that's all just, 
No, you don't need to do any of that. That's just mumbo jumbo, bro sciency garbage. You don't have to worry about that. Physiologically, the human body is primarily burning fat most of the time anyway. You don't need to train that. That's just how the body works. And that's not, I'm not saying this is like fringe theory or science or anything. This is exercise human physiology 101. <laughs> like, it's amazing to me when people talk about this. Like, I think you need to read just an exercise or ex a human physiology textbook on basic human metabolism. That's just always how the body works. But going back to burning, that opens us up to literally do whatever the hell you want. You don't have to do any kind of exercise to lose weight. You can burn it doing anything. And we get so fixated on this idea of training for weight loss, but you can't train skinny. You can train to be stronger. You can train to be faster. You can train for endurance. You can train to jump higher, but you can't train skinny. There's just simply no direct stimulus for weight loss from exercise. But the good news is you can burn extra fat and calories literally doing anything. So we don't want to think just exercise, think physical movement of any kind, because technically exercise is a kind of a made up concept in our imagination. Your, your body just knows physical activity. It doesn't matter if you're walking a dog or building a brick wall or lifting a barbell. The idea of I'm doing a workout or exercise is just like a border between states. We invented this divisional line for separate categories, but in the eyes of mother nature, it's just all physical activity creating a functional demand, which means that if I had to lose weight, I would really start to look at opportunities to be more physically active all day, every day. Why limit yourself to a workout? You know, a lot of people are like, you can't out train a bad diet. You're only burning several hundred calories in a workout. And they'll, yeah, you're right. The biggest limitation to our ability to burn extra calories is time, F pure time. When we are moving our body, we can increase our caloric expenditure. But the only three variables we have to do that is how much muscle we're using, which is why I'll never really burn a lot of calories doing like wrist rollers. <laughs> um, the intensity that you work at, once again, there's our intensity. You know, you can walk 100 miles, but you're going to burn more calories per unit of time if you sprint up a hill for 30 seconds, just because you're burning your engine faster. And time, that's it. Just pure, good old-fashioned time. And to a large degree, the ability to burn more calories is largely going to come down to that time aspect. The amount of muscle you're using, as long as you're doing basic general human activity, you're probably going to use most of your muscle. As far as intensity goes, that's going to be more of an activity-specific sort of thing. When I ski bumps at Mary Jane, that's pretty intense on my legs. But I'm not going to be like, okay, I'm going to go and walk you know, around the block. How do I make that intense? I'm like, you kind of aren't. Maybe you put a heavy weight vest on or something. That brings up the intensity. But it's kind of linked to the activity you're doing inherently. So time is the biggest variable. And a funny story, we've got a guy who uh, uh, one of the gyms I worked at, uh, we used to have these things called MyZone belts. And MyZone uses an energy tracker called a MEP. Uh, a MEP is kind of MyZone's in-house measurement of energy expenditure. And, <clears throat> and it's not calories because basically their whole idea is this is energy expenditure through physical activity. Because calorie readings can be off because it's also measuring the amount of calories you burn if you're just sitting there. Remember, we're always burning calories. You don't need to make calories and fat burn. It's always happening. When we do physical activity, you're just taking that process and speeding it up. That's all. So this guy has like an obscene amount of maps, like ridiculous. Usually a lot of people for a month, they're trying to get 2,000 maps. Uh, if they're really pushed down, they're getting 3,000 maps. Some of the real diehards at the gym will almost get 4,000 maps. And we've had people come into the gym who, you know, out of town and they're like, wow, 4,000 maps, geez. And then their eyes go to the top of the leaderboard because it, it ranks them. And they're like, 18,000 maps? Are you kidding me? Who is this guy? And it's like, yeah, he's always like that. He's always like way more than anyone else. And the answer is simple. He spends most of the day, every single day working out. We're talking hours upon hours upon hours of working out. And that's all there is to it. He just does a whole lot of it. 
That's and that basically that's the whole thing with calories. You want to burn more calories, you're just gonna have to do a whole lot more activity. And if you're relying on I do kettlebell exercises or I'm a power lifter or even I run a mile every day, great, wonderful. But no matter what you do, it's going to be very limited and it's probably not going to be as much as you think it is. That's why we want to expand beyond the workout. You want to think of Bernie outside the workout. And I'll get into some strategies how you can do that here in a second, but let's get to some more questions. Alex asking, hey Matt, do rest periods longer than two minutes can affect hypertrophy? Absolutely, uh, but in several ways. So rest periods depend on many different things. Um, basically, the point of a rest period is to get your muscles into a particular state of readiness for your next bout. And it depends entirely on what your goals are for that rest period. If you're really trying to drive uh, a uh, endurance and the ability to, to endure and have stamina, you want, of course, shorter rest periods because you want to have the sensation of working your muscles in a fatigued state, you know, mentally what that's like, emotionally what that's like, so forth. But when it comes to hypertrophy, what we want to do is we want to give our muscles enough rest that when we exercise it again, we can still work them very hard. But there's two ways you can look at this. Because in one area, like let's say you, you go and do some pull-ups on the rig over there and you get 10 pull-ups, okay? And you limit yourself to like 30 seconds and you jump up there and you get six, right? But if you rested more, you could have done more repetitions. You could have gotten like nine or 10 again. So in that regard, you'd be like, well, yeah, you want more rest because if you can get more work, that's working the muscle more. Okay, yeah. But a lot of the evidence in the scientific community seems to strongly suggest that a large part of your ability to drive the stimulus for hypertrophy comes from working the muscular work capacity. In other words, how hard can you work the muscle to the point where it's like, ah, I'm tapping out, I can't do anymore, you know, failure, if you will. So on that regard, you're like, but what if we keep the rest short? Wouldn't that make it easier to get to that point? And that's where a lot of like rest pause training comes from, where you'd get like 10 pull-ups and you'd literally drop down. You wouldn't even walk away. You'd just be kind of resting. Okay, here we go. And you'd get like one or two more and you're just really hammering the fatigue point in that muscle. That's a strategy too. So on both ends of the spectrum, we're theoretically potentially stimulating good hypertrophy, one by resting more and getting more work, but the other by resting less and really driving the fatigue. So what does that mean? Probably it may not matter. <laughs> it may not matter either way, as long as you're getting that muscle to the point where you're like, I'm really pushing hard. Then you could get there many different paths and roads, but you're kind of getting to the same destination. Me personally, I usually like to have a little bit more of a rest period because it's more satisfying to do a bit more work. But uh, personal preference is always, you go with what you feel like. A lot of people, they like to get one good set and they'll, they'll pause, get a couple reps, pause, get a couple reps, pause, get one more rep, and they drive the muscles down into the ground that way. Play with it and experiment, see what you like. My general recommendation though is rest as required. Rest as needed because there are so many other factors to consider too when it comes to, well, how do you know when you're ready? You know, your conditioning affects when you're ready. The exercise you're doing affects when you're ready. How far you pushed into fatigue affects when you're ready. The number of muscles that you're working, like you can do a heavy set of back squats and you need like 10 minutes to really recover, but you could do some, you know, ab rollouts and be ready to go in 20 seconds. So that's why I keep it flexible and like, Go when you're ready to go. When you want to go, just go. You don't need to like have a timer and be like, can I go now? Can I go now? Kind of thing. Uh, that's the sort of thing that you want to uh, play around with, but it doesn't have to be like a certain amount of time sort of thing. So back on topic, when it comes to burning calories, I recommend looking for physical activity outside of the workouts. So yes, your workout's great, wonderful. And I'm a big fan of you work out for the sake of functional ability. You know, I ride my mountain bike because I love riding my mountain bike. I practice Taekwondo to get good at Taekwondo. Same with the calisthenics. I don't do anything for the sake of weight loss because there's no such thing as weight loss exercise. So I do the activity for the sake of doing the activity and getting better and more proficient at that activity. But if I was like, I just need to burn a lot more calories, 
I would be active every day as much as I can. One of the biggest fans uh, things that I'm a fan of, walking. Anecdotally, I know a lot of the research, you don't burn that many calories walking and stuff. Yeah, but anecdotally, so many of the people I know who've lost a lot of weight and have kept it off make walking a regular staple in their routine. I, hell, I know one guy. It was crazy. It's like, you know, what'd you do this weekend? I walked 32 miles. And it's like, dear God, man, <laughs> like, holy hell. But he lost like 70 pounds or something using that as his primary exercise method. Not saying you need to do that, but that's the great thing about walking is that on the intensity spectrum, it's relatively low. So you can do a lot of it and you can do it every single day. And when it comes to we want to burn calories, we want a mix of durations and intensities, but the lower stuff is still very effective because it means that you can continue increasing your caloric expenditure every single day. You could have a die hard, blood, sweat, and tears, puking at the end, uh, you know, soul cycle class or Peloton or whatever, twice a week. And it feels really hard and intense, which it is, but it's only twice a week. At the end of the day, you just can't burn a whole lot of calories in a short period of time. It's, it, the math just is not there. Of course, the bigger you are, the more you burn, but it's just not there. I once wore a basic uh, calorie tracker during a mountain bike race. It was an hour long. And I mean, we're talking red line as hard as I possibly could go for an hour. And at the end, it was like 900 calories, which isn't trivial. 900 calories is still good. But for the amount of work that took, it was like, oh, hell no. Because I could only go at that intensity once or twice a week. It's 1,800 calories a week, which isn't too bad, but I burn a hell of a lot more than that just walking after dinner each night. So using both, use your physical activity and exercise for the sake of the exercise. The calorie burn is just a nice bonus. You don't need to worry about it. You don't even need to really track it. Just simply be active for the sake of being active. And then when you want to do other things, be active any way that you can. Walking, active commuting is another big one. When you're active in your commute, you are adding so much more physical activity to your weekly routine. It's ridiculous. Because like when I was in Japan, I'd ride my bike to school and then home again. It was like 35 minutes each way. So every day I was getting an over an hour worth of extra activity just going to and from school. And so you couple that or uh, you compare that with someone who works out twice or three times a week in the gym. It's not even close. It's not even close because you have two little workouts every single day. And some people will say, well, I work too far away. It's like, okay, that's fine. Well, you can park, you know, further from work and then walk the rest of the way in. Even if it's 10 minutes, you know, even if it's a 15, 10, 15 minute walk, that adds up. So active in commute, active in labor too. This is a strategy I used to do uh, back in the day, uh, which I did understand when I was struggling with my weight and stuff is that every summer I'd take on a, a job and it had to be a physical labor job. Man, I would burn calories by the truckload, stocking shelves with soda or washing cars and stuff, because I knew being active, even to a light degree, eight hours a day, blew away anything I did in a workout. Jen Zem, hey, Jen, good to see you. Hey, Matt, that homeostasis thing, is there any possibility to guarantee, oh, guesstimate at that? Uh, for April, I had a daily average of burnt calories around 4,300, keeping an eye on food, intake, it was about uh, 3,500. Mm. Such a fantastic question here. So here's one of the things to recognize about calorie balance. It is not simple and it is ridiculously complicated and very nuanced. So a lot of people are like, it's not as simple as calories in, calories out. Trust me, that ain't simple. We don't understand it fully. We're barely understanding it. Like we know more about black holes at the edge of the universe than we know about how our own metabolism handles changes in diet and exercise. It's crazy complicated. It's just right now the best model that we've got to explain how things work. So when it comes to calories in, calories out, a lot of people confuse that with calorie counting. You know, people say calories in, calories out didn't work for me. It's like, no, calorie counting didn't work for you. Calories in, calories out is pretty well verified by the science, but calorie counting is really fraught with a lot of issues and problems because you're trying to get an idea of how much you're burning and how much you're consuming, which is almost impossible to know accurately outside of a lab setting. And more importantly, those numbers are constantly moving. 
So it's kind of like if I took a black, you know, uh, clay pigeon and threw it into the night sky and told you to hit it with a, you know, a shot uh, gun and clay shooting and stuff. It's like, I can barely see it and it's moving. Like, how am I supposed to even hit know where I'm aiming with that? That's calorie, uh, counting. And not only that, you got to go for two targets at the same time because it's both in and out. Okay. Off of the soapbox there. That said, that doesn't mean that getting some sort of an estimation is not valuable. And so a lot of times when people are trying to initially lose weight or they've been trying to lose it a while, getting some sort of a caloric estimate can be an enlightening thing where you look at, oh, I'm sure I'm around 2000 calories or so. And then you go with my fitness pal and you're tracking what you're eating and stuff. And you're like, Okay, that's a lot more than I thought. Oh, those little nibbles, you know, at the office, uh, you know, coffee break party or something is that really added up and stuff. So it can be a good way to get kind of a bit more of a clear picture on what's going on. But it's certainly not something I would reliably rely uh, rely on for long term weight losses. You know, when people come to me and they're like, I don't know why I'm losing weight. I eat 2,500 calories a day and I'm burning 2,200 calories a day. I'm like, no. There's no way you have that type of accuracy. It is no way. I mean, you, in some studies, people find that you could be off on both by 30%. And we're talking hundreds, maybe even over a thousand calories of difference one way or the other. So the body always is true. You know, if, if someone comes to me and they're like, I'm in a calorie deficit, but I'm not losing weight. No, you're not. <laughs> you're not in a calorie deficit. It's that simple. You're perceiving a calorie deficit based on your numbers, but we got to tweak things a little bit. But it's a good place to start and get some estimations, and that's that's pretty much about uh, it. Okay, last couple of questions here real quick. Uh, Ushain, hey, Matt, is it better to go all the way down to a dead hang at every rep as opposed to always keeping my shoulders packed down. I always recommend keeping things packed, not because a lot of people are like, it's bad for your joints and everything like that, but because uh, you're turning off and that dead hang. Yeah, it could be a good stretch, but the point is strength training. We're trying to keep the muscle working and it's harder, yes, but just because it's harder doesn't mean it's better. Remember, we want things to be difficult for the right reasons. We can make exercise and dieting and stuff hard a million different ways, but usually when we make something harder for the wrong reasons, we're actually, again, putting obstacles along that path that we're trying to travel. Remember, success follows the path of least resistance. Putting extra resistance and making the exercise harder than it needs to be without any extra productivity is only holding you back. So when we are doing things where we're losing the tension at the bottom, you know, you losing tension is not always bad. If you're doing squats and you come up all the way, you kind of shake out the legs a little bit before going back down. That's fine. That's okay. It's like, ah, oh, let me get a shake out, get a couple more reps here. Great. It's like the pause rep training I'm talking about. But when people are like coming all the way down and they're dropping and they're losing it, you're literally killing off the stimulus, telling your muscles to get stronger in that moment. So keep them packed, keep them tight, and you're not going to have any downside but you're going to lose a lot of the potential difficulty of the exercise that just doesn't need to be there. And that's the entirely reason why I say don't do the dead hang. Keep the, keep the going with uh, uh, the, the intensity in the muscles. And last but not least, we got Mariano. Hey, Matt, do you have any experience with obese clients who had to seek psychological help in order to reach an adequate weight? Awesome question to end on. Very good. Because yes, we're talking a lot about the physical aspect of weight loss here. But from a fundamental perspective of how fitness works, we recognize that yes, the fundamental processes of mother nature, calories in, calories out, or an exercise, stimulus and adaptation. That's how our body is operating and this is how we can influence those processes. Great, wonderful, awesome, but that's not even close to enough. Not even close. You can know everything there is to know about diet and exercise and how to lose weight in the optimal of this and that and stuff. But at the end of the day, we also have to take into account the principle and the fundamental processes of human nature. And I, I did a little short on the YouTube channel about this the other day, about how I said, if you have the best diet and the best workout program, but your asterisk behind it is it works great as long as people are willing to do the work and nobody's seemingly willing to do the work, it's a bad program. Because at the end of the day, it's your feelings and emotional state that is going to control your habits and beliefs and your patterns. 
You can know everything there is to know about nutrition. But if someone walks into the office with a dozen cupcakes and you're like, oh, I just love cupcakes. I can't stop eating them. You're eating cupcakes. <laughs> we are products of our emotional state. So a lot of times struggles with weight, the ability to lose weight boils largely down to our emotional state of how do you feel about exercise? How do you feel about food? How do you feel about weight loss? Because a lot of times, if you have negative connotations about weight loss or negative feelings about a healthier diet or exercise, man, that's an uphill battle. And it doesn't matter what you learn. It doesn't matter how great your program is. It doesn't matter what heart rate variable zones burn the most fat and everything. If you just absolutely detest being physically active and having a healthier diet, man, that's going to be a real uphill battle. It's going to be really, really tough, which is why a lot of times, especially people who lose a lot of weight, it's a personal introspection and change. Most of the people I've known who do lose a good amount of weight tell me that the reason why they lost it was because they changed something inside of themselves emotionally. They felt differently about themselves. They felt differently about their health. They felt differently about food. They felt differently about exercise. And in a lot, a lot of cases, they didn't do anything as far as learning anything about diet and exercise. They didn't learn anything new. They may have just had a scary thing, like a scary prognosis from a doctor. And overnight, they were like, oh my gosh. And they feel differently suddenly about what they're doing and they change like that. So a lot of this really is an emotional thing. It really is a psychological thing. We talk all day, I did this whole podcast about the physical aspects of the human body, but really that's such a small percentage of what really needs to be addressed when it comes to true personal change to lose weight and to remove the struggle of weight loss. Because that's what happened to me. I had tons of struggles with diet and exercise and body dysmorphia and stuff. And now I don't worry about any of that stuff. And it was entirely psychological. I didn't change anything about what I did physically. I didn't find some weird, one weird trick. I didn't try to hack mother nature because you can't, you know, that's the thing is biohacking and stuff. You can't hack mother nature. You just learn the rules and play by them better. That's all the uh, that you can do with that sort of thing. So let's see. I think I addressed things. If you have further questions, as always, by all means, DM me at Red Delta Project on the Instagram. And uh, thank you very much, folks, for watching. I'm going to take off and uh, I will talk to you folks next week. Don't forget all of the resources down below uh, that help to support the show, including the micro workouts book that I mentioned before. And if you have on the Instagram, post pictures of yourself with the hashtag RDP race, then I will send you a, a coupon code for a free Spartan race that's going on here in Colorado Springs on June 12th, I think it is. I have to double check that. But free Spartan race uh, in, entrance if you're in town and always want to do a Spartan race, now's your chance. I thank you all for watching, listening, and thank you very much as always. I'll talk to you next week. Till then, be fit and live free.